If you're studying for the INBDE, I highly recommend INBDE Bootcamp, an all-in-one study resource that will help you pass your exam. Use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, Dr. Ryan here, and welcome back to our oral diagnosis series. Let's continue with developmental anomalies involving the salivary glands. Salivary glands develop from ectodermal tissue at around six weeks in utero. Unfortunately, things can and do go wrong with formation of the salivary glands during embryogenesis. Salivary gland aplasia, or agenesis, is the congenital absence of salivary glands. Usually, the term relates to the absence of some or all of the major salivary glands, including the parotid, submandibular, and sublingual glands. Salivary gland atresia is congenital blockage or absence of the opening of a major salivary gland duct or part of the duct itself. Most commonly involved is the submandibular salivary gland duct, also called Wharton's duct. You can see this arrow pointing to a blocked Wharton's duct in this image. And finally, we have salivary gland aberrancy, which is where we have a normal salivary gland developing in an abnormal position. For example, ectopic salivary gland tissue could develop on a palatine tonsil, like we see the arrow pointing to in this image. Next, I want to talk about Sjogren's syndrome, which is frequently asked about on the board exam. This is an autoimmune condition, which means the body's immune system malfunctions and mistakes its own healthy tissue as pathogenic and attacks it. This immune response is mediated by lymphocytes, which is extremely important to remember. Sjogren's patients have, generally speaking, more aggressive lymphocytes, which means they're also at a higher risk of developing lymphatic cancer, also called lymphoma. Sjogren's syndrome involves lymphocytes flooding in, infiltrating, and destroying the lacrimal glands in the eyes and the salivary glands in the mouth. This leads to keratoconjunctivitis sicca, which is a fancy way of saying dry eyes, and xerostomia, which is a fancy way of saying dry mouth. These are the main two symptoms. The salivary glands tend to get swollen, tender, and inflamed as a result of the lymphocytic infiltration. Most commonly affected by this are the parotid glands, which you see this patient's left parotid gland swelling up as a result. Sjogren's syndrome can be classified into two main categories. Primary, which means you have only the primary symptoms of dry eyes and dry mouth, and secondary, which is much more common, which means you have those same classical symptoms plus another autoimmune connective tissue disease, usually rheumatoid arthritis or sometimes lupus erythematosus. Four diagnostic lab tests used for Sjogren's syndrome diagnosis include anti-Rho or SSA, anti-LA or SSB, anti-nuclear antibody, and rheumatoid factor, all of which are helpful biomarkers for this autoimmune condition. Treatment usually involves managing symptoms with artificial tears and artificial saliva, and maybe some low-dose corticosteroids to help calm the immune system down. Before we continue, I have to tell you about this incredible AI study tool that will help quiz you on what you're learning in this video, and it's called Wisdolia. It'll give you an outline, flashcards, and even case scenario questions customized from this video. And as you answer the questions, you'll get personalized feedback to tell you exactly what you got right, what you got wrong, and why. You can find the Wisdolia link in the description below. Now, back to the video. 
lingual mandibular bone defect, or staphne bone defect, surprisingly fits in this category of developmental disturbances of the salivary glands. And here's why. Ectopic or aberrant salivary gland tissue, which we talked about before just two slides ago, associated with the submandibular gland can cause pressure resorption on the lingual cortical plate of the posterior mandible, resulting in this well-circumscribed unilocular radiolucency. A good way to differentiate it from other lesions that may look similar to this is that it always occurs below the mandibular canal, where that inferior alveolar nerve travels through. It's always, always below that nerve canal. This lingual concavity or depression in the jaw requires no treatment. It's usually just an incidental finding on a panoramic radiograph. And lastly, we have glandular colitis, also called colitis glandularis which is an uncommon disease that usually affects the lower lip of adults. I could have included this condition in the lips and palate video, but it more closely involves the salivary glands, so it's here. It's characterized by swollen minor salivary glands that cause enlargement and eversion of the lower lip and secretion of clear, thick mucus, hence the leaky lower lip. The cause of glandular colitis is frankly unknown. Some believe it's developmental in origin, while others theorize it's related to sun exposure and lip biting. That's it for this video lecture. Thank you so much for watching. I genuinely appreciate it. I'd also really appreciate if you consider clicking that like button below this video, subscribing to the channel if you have not already, sharing this video with your friends, and leaving a comment below letting me know what you thought. All of those things can really help to grow the channel. If you want to go above and beyond supporting me and what I do here, please check out the Patreon page linked below. If you want to join there, you'll get access to exclusive practice questions, exclusive study guides, a Discord server, and so, so much more. And if you see at the end of my videos, I have an end credits screen, and all of those names there are the names of my amazing Patreon supporters that I'm honored to have. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.